there's an opening question. Yes, well, um, being the uh, oracle of all knowledge, that's, that's, that's one I actually can't answer. There has been considerable discussion about that, about changing the axis of the earth and things by sending things from one side to another. Um, all I can say is Mother Nature always gets even in the end. And if we don't slow down a little, there will be no turning back. Um, with regard to the rail lines, the reason why coal has come to our area is because we have a rail line. The reason why we have a rail line is because it was built to take grain and wool and cattle because they were productive agricultural areas. The areas that don't have rail lines weren't productive agricultural areas. They may still have coal under them, but they are, it is not viable, supposedly, for this industry that has so much money it doesn't know what to do with it to build a new rail line purpose-built for its carriage. So I don't quite understand how it works. Um, there is considerable confrontation going on between the um, wheat board or the grains board and the Mac village, which is the village that is designed to house the construction workers for the mine, which was supposed to be built at Weres yeah. Creek, which is one of our larger um, grain terminals. And the Mac Village people decided that they were going to build on a sports field some 300 metres from the grain terminal, then wrote to the grain terminal and said, well, you're not going to be able to take delivery 24 hours because we have workers living here. So um, the grains board took Mac villages to court and that's yet to play out. So that's going to be a very interesting thing when they come into your area and then start saying we can't use it for what it was actually designed to do in this town. This is true. Do, Pete, do you need the microphone for the recording? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, next, anyone? Um, there's been a fair bit of talk, and I don't know whether it's coming from the Liverpool Plains or whether it's just in the Hunter, of New South Wales adopting a royalty for the regions program like they have in Western Australia. Um, I had grave concerns about this. If one, if you follow the, the logic of reasoning that the, the, that the mining companies are digging all this gas up on our behalf, the royalty should actually go to the whole of Australia. But if the royalties are actually needed to go back to the regions to fix up the mess that the coal companies and the gas companies have made, shouldn't that be the part of their cost of business? And shouldn't we be going, no, the royalties shouldn't be going back to the region because they should just be paying for that anyway? Can I to Tim? Yeah, um, I think you've, you've touched on an issue that's to do with the externality, what we call the externalities of mining a, anything in particular. So um, the, the costs, the external costs are the effects on social, social effects, health effects, uh, the cost of rehabilitation uh, and those sorts of flow on things that, that are not direct costs to the um, industry, to the mining company, but they are flow on effects. And if you include, just as an example, I'm not sure about coal seam gas, although I'm sure it's, it makes um, gas an extraordinarily expensive commodity, but if you add the, um, and this study is being done in, in the United States, if you add all the externalities to the price of coal, it becomes one of the most expensive sources of energy. Um, and so the, you know, the, whole, the whole argument that coal is cheap and plentiful is really, really not grounded in reality at all. Um, and I'll get to Well, putting my local government hat on, um, we have considerable experience in Gunnedah Shire where we don't have the money to look after the roads that we have. There are roads that the mines built, um, purpose built for the mines, those mines closed down. We're now left with bitumen roads that we didn't want, we didn't ask for. There are no future funds put aside for those roads to be maintained into the future. and. Our main roads in the area that have considerably more traffic than the roads that were put in for the mines, we can't afford to actually look after those. So 
whilst um, I hear what you're saying about that money should go to the whole nation as such, there has to be some local return for the impost of having the industries like they are. How that is divvied up, I can't imagine, but I certainly know on our very small scale in Gunnada that the impost that we have from those projects is absolutely huge. So I don't think there is an answer, but certainly there needs to be more money coming back. And when you look at a project like Chenois, if they um, produce what they are intending to produce through their lifespan, that project is actually worth about $92 billion on the current coal price, and they are putting $5 million into a community fund to try and get a social licence to operate. So try telling me there's not something wrong with that. Actually, on that topic, I, I was listening to the radio this morning quite serendipitously, and um, the, Josh Fox was on the... It was an American broadcast. I don't know if you've, you're aware of uh, Gasland the movie. Now, Josh Fox did that movie. Some will call him a documentary maker. Others will call him a journalist. Others call him a fairy tale maker from Disney. But anyway... There was some discussion on there, as, um, as um, Helen was saying, about uh, pavilion in Wyoming. And the water from those wells is stunting plant growth. It's actually stunting the plant growth. The plants are just crook. But the point I wanted to make here on, on this topic, Jacinda, is that the EPA has agreed to deliver fresh water to four homes in Dimmick due to contamination. That is a major... Um, acceptance of some guilt here, but this is the point. They have said that they are going to put in a water line worth $12 million to serve 18 families. So where does that balance up if you're going to spend all this money to serve 18 families? Like, it, the, the, the proportions and the magnitude of the money and the damage are, are just extreme. And this, this is, this is as, recent, as recent as today, Josh Fox, he got arrested and removed from a public, a public Senate hearing on Capitol Hill on Friday, I think it was. Um, so you've got this situation where people are being attacked for reporting the truth and stating the facts. You've got the bullying and the manipulation that Tim was talking about. And whatever tactics are being used there, these companies work internationally. So expect the same. Thanks. All that uh, raises the question of responsibility. Um, for example, in terms of the coal seam gas mining that's been done in the United States, I think it was Helen mentioned how when they've finished the mining, uh, they just simply cap it um, and walk the mining companies and walk away and leave it. And uh, the security of how they do that, you know, is not proven. So there's the risk that it could rust and it could decay and, and so on and, and further gas could escape. Um, I must say just quickly that I've been incredibly moved by hearing um, what Tim and Rosemary have said you know, from the front line of this fight. And uh, I appreciate you coming here to talk to us and sharing all that with us. And I hope, you know, when you go back home, you can take um, some encouragement back with you that people in Sydney are listening and going to do their best to uh, work with you. One of the things we obviously do have to do is to make the mining companies responsible for the total cost. Again, like Helen said about coal, if you add in all these uh, in, you know, incidental costs that their, their accountants um, don't add up, um, maybe that's one strategy we should force, that they need to be responsible for the total cost. 
and that includes the long-term um, security and environmental sustainability, etc., of the areas that they've destroyed and compensation to local communities and so forth. So is there any action being taken um, in that area to make these companies fully responsible for the damage they do? We've done considerable work in trying to um, have it adopted at the point of expiration that a landholder has a parent company guarantee. And for instance, with regard to BHP, back to the limited assets of London, not the Coal Mines Australia assets, which go to a holding company uh, via the Netherlands and several other places because of tax construction. Because one of the major issues is, as we saw with James Hardy and asbestos, that what happens is the company under which they operate their Australian operations suddenly loses all its assets overnight and we end up with this huge bill. Now, there are some 130 something or other, a last count, mines in New South Wales that are in suspended animation. Now the reason why they are in suspended animation because is if they are decommissioned, they need to be rehabilitated. And a lot of those mines that are um, creating acid mine leakage into the infrastructure surrounding where they are, have got, the government might have a five, ten, twenty thousand dollar bond to rehabilitate those mines with a 30 or 40 million dollar cleanup bill. So they don't decommission them, they simply put them in suspended animation. And if you look behind those projects, many of the operational companies that have those projects suspended now have got dead directors and tuppence halfpenny in the bank with no possible recourse for anyone um, in the Canadian model, they actually have to pay rehabilitation fees as you go along, and they put up a huge fee, like $100 million at the beginning, which is pay given back to them as they progress and they rehabilitate. So in Australia, we have an appalling record for doing that, and we have very, very bad standards that are enforced, and it is something that as a community, we have looked at doing considerable work on. And certainly with my political connections, I've done a considerable amount of work in doing that as well. Uh, just following up on that idea of action, uh, yeah, action at the idea of legislation for the uh, uh, responsibility for companies to pay up uh, and action at the farm gate and all those things in the local community. But the, my question is to Helen, really, about the doctors. You know, uh, what uh, forms of action uh, has been going on, and wh uh, who do you lobby, or uh, and maybe what's your base you're working from? But if you could tell us something about your action part, you know, please. Good question. So, <laughs> so we're all we're all um, busy doctors, and. Um, some are retired, uh, who sort of put in a bit more. We're from all around Australia. We've also got a very active uh, medical student body. Actually, they're just they're some of the most creative uh, bits of our organisation, and um, and they've done some really fantastic, fantastic things. We run um, little conferences. Uh, we participate. We um, get um, plenary sessions in in conferences. Try to educate our peers about about the issues. Um, write submissions to um, things that we think are, are important to represent the health aspects on, such as um, coal, coal, development, coal development, such as these parliamentary inquiries into coal seam gas. Um, we lobby politicians. I'm going there this, this Thursday to Canberra to see um, Convey and um, the independents as well, on not only coal seam gas but coal as well. Um, so we have um, a small but very active um, sort of active membership and then quite a large membership base around, around the country. Um, and we're trying to expand that because um, 
you know, it, but it's interesting how few people, well, you have to sort of really spell it out to people and make, make, get them to think along the lines of, well, um, you know, ultimately all this environmental damage, it affects our health. And actually it's affecting it already. It's just we, people don't talk about it um, and people just um, carry on as though everything's fine and when it's not. So I guess we do a lot of work around climate change um, as well. And um, so, so yeah, and, and all our work is on the website. There's a lot of articles written and things like that. It's all on, on our website, dea.org. Hello. Yes, there, there's another issue that links uh, grain with uh, fuel. I read recently that uh, the United States government has an ambition to fuel its whole navy with uh, biofuel, and uh, they have some uh, some link with uh, the Manildra Group, and um, I think they're expecting to do some uh, distilling on the the east coast here. So on the one hand they're acting as if uh, grain is um, an endless supply and on the other they're, um, they're destroying the, the source of it. Uh, I was going to ask if you could explain to me uh, what this gas is going to be used for, if it's um, domestic or uh, industrial. Are we actually, you're referring to the ethanol or you're referring to the, you're referring to the CSG? There's, there's two parts of the... CSG. Right. Well, the, uh, we'll just answer a little bit about the ethanol for a moment. Um, uh, lots of people see the uh, feedlotting industry as being the, you know, the big bad feedlotters. Um, maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but one thing about ethanol production is um, as you have a lot of ethanol production in the US, they actually use the grain from the ethanol production then to go into feeding livestock. Um, so it's actually, while there's lots of discussion about taking grain out of food production for ethanol, it actually is one part of the process where you actually then can use those byproducts for other things. With regard to the um, CSG industry, they are talking about using that for um, energy for generating electricity, um, running engines, so you would actually have um, gas engines. Um, in the US where you have natural gas, where people are allowed to use their own um, gas on their own properties, you have many farmers that run all their irrigation pumps on their own gas. But the CSG um, gas is slightly harder to use, more harmful to machinery. Oh, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> and um, <laughs> um, more harmful to machinery, it's a much harsher thing. But it is used in um, electricity production, running engines and the like. And I'm sure Rosemary will have comment on this as well. Um, and they're also in Sydney, there's a, there's a massive, what to some people is a conspiracy cover-up, where City of Sydney is promoting the use of tri-generation plants in yeah. buildings. Absolutely. City of Sydney is saying that they cannot be used with coal seam gas, and their plan is that they actually will actually use um, biogas, gas generated from, from rubbish tips. The coal seam gas companies are completely denying that and saying, yep, it's perfect for tri-generation, and they want to actually put the coal seam gas wells next to tri-generation plants. So do you believe the government? Do you believe the gas companies? But yeah, 6% of your natural gas in your stove in Sydney is now coal seam gas. One of the things that's come out recently in Queensland is that um, the Anna Bly had said that there is going to be 20% gas, coal seam gas used um, domestically. She's now said, no, it's all for export and we may 
retain a couple of gas fields for our use later on. So most of this coal seam gas is going overseas for export. I think AG or Camden is the only one that's using it domestically. And um, it's, um, you know, it's a thing that constantly comes up with gas companies because they say, we, you know, you need it and all this sort of stuff, but it's going overseas. So there you are. I don't have a question as such, I'd just like to um, tell you who I am and why I'm here. My name is John Perry, I'm a councillor on Holroyd City Council, and I'm also the Senior Vice President of WESROC, which is a Western Sydney regional organisation of councils which represent ten of the biggest councils in New South Wales. I raised this issue last year and put it on the agenda for WESROC to take up the issue of coal seam gas mining in New South Wales, and particularly in our farming areas. We've already had Dr Redmond come out and speak to us at WESROC. I was born in the country, I come from the country, I know and been involved in farming for most of my life. The critical issue that I see from, from our point of view is that metropolitan Sydney has to get involved now. The country people cannot win this argument by themselves. I can give you an assurance now that WESROC has it on the agenda we intend to lobby all councils in New South Wales. We intend to lobby the LGSA and lobby our state politicians and put pressure on them from a united local government front to take up this issue on behalf of our farmers and to ensure the future of our food supply in New South Wales and Australia. Because it's no good us sitting back. We're complacent in metropolitan Sydney when it comes to country issues. It's got a small gathering here tonight, but the majority of, New, of metropolitan New South Wales will not realise the damage that's being done until it's too late and there's no food on the shelves. So I'd just like to give you people a commitment here tonight that WESROC will be lobbying hard to ensure that the entire New South Wales Local Government Association supports the farmers of New South Wales and stops this ridiculous coal seam gas mining in our area. Do you have any comments on that one? Or? Only good luck with it because you'll need it. Because there's a lot of people that are very supportive of the gas industry and local government, and I face them on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, they say it's regional development, and it's, um, it's not regional development at all. So thank you very much and we're very grateful. Indeed. Mm. I want to echo those those comments because I think the the question of moving now, I mean I think the speakers have really made such a utterly compelling case. And the question of not waiting, um, already Queensland has thousands of wells um, and and more many more tens of thousands more in the pipelines and, and uh, we, we don't want to see that um, go ahead and it's going to be a lot harder if it does go ahead to reverse it. Um, so now is the time really to move and I think we do have to take the words of Rosemary and, and Tim um, to heart in terms of getting, you know, the city needs to join on the blockades um, and down at, at Macquarie Street and I'm part of Stop CSG Sydney along with uh, Jacinta and, and others here, but I think we, we need more people um, certainly joining in there. I mean, we have our own, you know, uh, this is coming to the city as well in terms of St Peter's and, and the, um, the entire Sydney Basin is a, a licence to drill. Uh, but also, I mean, even if that wasn't the case, it's the food, it's the water um, and, and so on. Um, also, I think there's a media war on, and I think that's something that we've got to um, wage as well. Um, the, the advertising, the second trench of the advertising is, is uh, coming. Gina Reinhardt's buying up her share of the media, so we can expect to... to uh, she, she doesn't do that for no reason. Um, the um, question I wanted to ask was around um, your take on the hypocrisy, it seems to me, quite blatant hypocrisy of the state government in regards to wind compared to coal seam gas. Um, we have wind, uh, we have much more stringent uh, laws, regulations, etc., coming down, 
uh, where little or zero evidence uh, of, of harm from, from wind power uh, and just some uh, strong lob strong, strongly supported lobby groups, uh, and then coal seam gas with massive evidence uh, of problems, health problems, environmental problems, water problems, etc., um, and social problems, and uh, they're just doing nothing about it. So if you could comment on that. Yeah, it's outrageous. Um, and we're, um, we have a um, position statement on, on wind as well, and we've, um, we've got quite a lot of public health physicians in amongst our membership who are pretty active. So we've, we've gone and we've re reviewed all the literature regarding um, the health effects of, of, of wind power and this sort of so-called wind turbine syndrome. Um, and, um, and there is no good evidence for, um, for health impacts that are directly from the wind turbines. Um, unfortunately, people, well, people, some people don't like them and they don't want them there and they do cause annoyance and they do cause some level of noise, but the, the, the regulation of the wind, wind industry was already very tight, much tighter than the gas industry in terms of setbacks, in terms of getting consent of landholders. You know, I mean, the wind industry was already, um, you know, being extremely careful about the way they went about things, and now they've just made it so difficult. Um, so uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to me um, at all um, when we've got um, climate change on our doorstep and we've got a clean option um, that can work and in parts of Europe wind energy has been used for generations upon generations uh, without any ill effects and you know I think um, there's a lot of fear mongering there's a lot of um, you know, uh, people who are very active in trying to get just the wrong message across to government and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a disaster because the government's actually listening, um, but not to the right people. Oh, the watermelons brought on some wind. <laughs> when I um, saw wind turbines in Germany 25 years ago, I remember driving across the landscape and thinking, don't they look fantastic? So I'm not quite sure what everyone carried on about. Um, the only criticism I have of the current wind industry and the turbines that they are building is that since they started building the gearboxes in India rather than Germany, um, they tend to replace them much more frequently and they're a couple of million bucks each time they do that and that I think is very poor form and they should be going back to German or Dutch or Swiss technology to, to build those gearboxes because the Indian ones simply don't stand up. Um, I know many people that live close to the wind farms at Bungandor. I've spent a lot of time around the ACT and none of those people have got criticisms of them. I have never lived close to one but certainly I don't find them offensive on the um, landscape and I find it absolutely phenomenal that people will carry on about a wind tower the way they carry on about it and yet you can build a coal mine 300 metres from someone's house, an open cut coal mine, and that is not regulated, and yet you can't put a wind turbine up. So I, I just cannot come at the double standard on it. And I think that um, wind power forms an important part of the alternative energy paths in which we need to go down. I don't think we can turn the whole of Australia into wind energy, but I do think we need solar. I'm not even a great um, uh, fan of geothermal, having seen what geothermal does to water resources. And certainly I think geothermal has a very long way to go. But I think solar thermal plants are indeed a very exciting prospect. And we should be grabbing them with both hands and building as many as we can. Thanks, Tim. It's come down to that part of the night where I have to call for last drink questions. <laughs> What's the official position of the New South Wales Farmers Association? And what do they say to their friends and colleagues within the nationals who sit in the New South Wales government? <laughs> 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 
I'll take that as a comment. <laughs> um, uh, who's having a crack? I'll have a crack. Tim, have a crack. Well, I... <laughs> Um, we might go to the um, nationals first. Um, I felt so strongly about the uh, performance of the nationals in regional New South Wales that I stood in the state election against a um, sitting member of um, some 23 years and uh, removed about 9% off his primary vote in an election that was uh, basically a landslide for the coalition. I think that the uh, Nationals are no longer the National Party, they are the multinational party. <laughs> and I think the way that they have behaved towards regional Australia and the people that have supported them and believed in them for so long has been unbelievably disappointing. And if I was cruel, I would say it was totally disgraceful. Um, Fiona Simpson started with us um, at Karuna Coal. Um, in the first instance, she is now the president of New South Wales Farmers, and they have done an enormous amount of work in the background um, trying to get some resolution in the um, regional land use policies, in the understanding um, of land use conflict. And one thing that comes very loud and clear is that the mining industry will not negotiate if it comes to giving anything up. And one point that I failed to make in my earlier um, speech was, good fences make good neighbours, and until we draw fences around those industries and set certain areas aside for certain things, then it is basically civil war and that is what we are facing is a land use war. And until a government admits that we actually do have to fence things out, that we have to set areas aside to grow wine, to breed thoroughbreds, to mine, to grow grain, to graze cattle, to grow wool, to grow cotton, to do the things we do as um, landowners, there will be no resolution in this. And there does need to be lines drawn where they say you cannot mine here. Never, ever, ever, ever. And in those mine proposals, if they are approved for a 30 or a 40 or a 50 million tonne mine, that's all they ever are. They can't be a 10 million tonne mine that becomes a 250 million tonne mine and they just keep on getting approved and approved to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what happens. Because it's just like one morning, you wake up and there's one grasshopper on your lawn. And you look out there and think, look at that cute little green grasshopper. And the next morning you roll out and there's 55 million of them on the front lawn. Everything's been eaten, it's bare and you're starving to death. Well, that's what we're suffering now. We've got the 55 million of them eating everything. Thank you, Tim. Like anything, uh, things have to come to an end. Uh, what can I say about our three speakers? Helen, Rosemary, Tim, I mean, we've been very fortunate tonight to be present with them and to feel their drive and their energy, but we also need to respect that that drive and energy is, is just not endless. Uh, they're fighting every single day, um, and it's it's long, and it's a it's a it's a difficult battle. And whilst they can come out in a in a public meeting like this and distill that energy and and build inspiration, uh, they also have to rebuild themselves and keep getting up each morning. But I feel comfortable in the knowledge that it, it's the land that that that. Fuels, fuels that energy. They, they get it from the land. I mean, their, their families have been on the land. They understand the land. They take energy from the land. They return from their campaigns down in the city and in the government and in, in the corridors of um, so-called power. And uh, then they return home to try and refuel. But we, we really need to, to back and support them as best we can and spread, spread tonight's talk, spread the information that you've got 
put it out there on your social media circles, speak to your neighbour, make copies of tonight's talk, because as some of the other, uh, and, and the Wesrock, as the representative of Wesrock mentioned, we need to get everyone in the city behind this. And uh, on behalf of everyone here tonight, I'd just like to thank the three of you for your energy, your effort, along with the other groups in Sydney, the Stop Coal Seam Gas in Sydney, who are well represented here today, and who are putting in the same amount of energy and the same amount of effort and need that support. So join the Karuna Coal Action Group, join the Coal Seam Gas, uh, what's the exact title? Stop CSG Sydney. Stop CSG Sydney, I knew it changed. Um, but join, join those and spread that information and get behind these people. You don't have to live in the Liverpool Plains to join the Karuna Coal Action Group. You all live in Sydney, so join the Stop CSG Sydney and get out there and spread this word and support these fine people because uh, they need our support because they're supporting us at the end of the day. So I'd, I'd just like to get Liz up uh, to um, thank our speakers with uh, a little bit of... Uh... Yeah, we've got a bottle of wine, so thank the speakers. Thank you very much. Um, and that's, that's uh, um, Marva Costa. Um, it's an extremely small token of our appreciation because we really do appreciate what it takes to come and talk about it. And I think um, Rosemary got quite emotional, but I think some people in the room would have felt quite emotional today because it's really, we take so much of what we have and, and the bounty that we have in this land for granted and we can't afford to do that. And I think, you know, there's nobody in this room who doesn't agree with that, but it's really timely to get reminded and to be reminded with the real feeling and, and passion and also the, the great information you've given this evening to remind us to keep, out, keep on going tomorrow and tomorrow and to take that out to everybody we know and to stop taking things for granted. That there's, there is, there is, there are, there's progress that I believe we can make. If I didn't, I'd just, I wouldn't get out of bed tomorrow. But it, it's bloody hard work and, I, and it's something that's very unrelenting. Thank you for the work you're doing on our, all of our behalf and I hope that we can start to repay some of that work and add to the work that you're doing. Thank you.